Hello, welcome to my office. In this video, I'm going to be building a desk to replace this one, mainly because it does this. And that's no good when you're trying to record podcasts or narrate videos. It also looks more like an office worker's desk than a woodworker's desk, so I want to make something a bit nicer. And I need more storage space to get rid of all this stuff in my corner of shame. I have a lot of slabs of beach stored, and I pulled out the nicest pieces I could find. These slabs are very old, twisted and warped. They'd been stored for well over 15 years, so I know that the wood is nice and dry. The original plan was to keep the boards as wide as possible, so for that reason I decided to use my router sled to flatten them. But that didn't really work out as planned, and I'll talk about that in more detail later in the video. I set up my dust containment booth, in other words, tarps hung from the ceiling, and got started. With the first side flat, I rotated the slab and worked on the other side. So here's where I'm at so far. I've got one board fully flattened, both top and bottom, and these other two slabs, I've just flattened one of the faces. I've got an idea in my head of how I want the desk to look, and originally I wanted to keep the full width to form the main part of the desk. However, I've got a bit of a problem because this slab is still measuring about 42 millimeters in thickness and having a desktop that thick isn't really a good idea because the desktop's just going to be way too heavy. To get this down to about 30 millimeters thick, which is roughly where I want to be, it's probably gonna take another seven or eight passes with the router. And that takes a lot of time and also creates a lot of dust in my workshop. Even though the dust curtains do a great job at containing the larger particles of dust, I do still get fine particles of dust laying on all of the surfaces elsewhere. So I've changed my mind about using the full width of this slab. I'm actually going to cut it down in half and that will enable me to fit it through my thickness planer, which is just going to be a much more efficient way of working. So here I'm using the track saw to rip it down in half in two passes. This felt like a bit of a shame because it would have been nice to have these boards wide and also I had wasted a lot of time, probably over half a day, flattening with my router when I could have just ripped these in half to begin with, but never mind. So time to get the planer set up and I have this on a height adjustable table so that I can set it up to outfeed onto my workbench. Beach always seems to plane really well. It came out really smooth and clean, no tear out. I can then flip the board and run it through again to get rid of the marks left by the router bit. With the beach all milled up, I went to get some sapili, which is my favorite wood, and I really like how it looks against light colored woods, like beach. Again, all the pieces that I have are pretty twisted, so I first need to plane this to get one face nice and true. Sapili doesn't tend to plane so well, and I got quite a lot of tear out, but this beautiful grain made up for it. This piece has what I think is some spalting in it. You can see that dark black line through it, and I love that. I can then run the flat face against the fence to get one edge plane square. And before moving on, I just check it with my engineer's square. While I'm at it, I can get all the edges square on the beach pieces too. And then back to thickness and mode to get the rest of the faces squared and cleaned up. I may mean to get all the boards down to about 30 millimeters in thickness. So after two whole days of milling timber and eight bags full of shavings, I can finally move on to the next stage. Here I'm figuring out how wide I can rip each of my boards to, so I'm just measuring the boards at their thinnest point and then writing that measurement on the face so that I can just go straight to the table saw, making sure my blade is square to the table, and then I can set the fence accordingly and rip each piece down. I spent some time deciding what sides I want face up and face down and also trying to match the grain between boards. So here for example where these two boards meet, you'll see it's nice tight grain which is going to help give the illusion of it being a wide board rather than two boards joined together once this is all glued up. When I'm happy, I draw a triangle onto the faces so that it's easier to figure out which boards go back in which order. Even though I had planed all of the edges, for some reason there always seems to be some boards that don't meet together perfectly. Whether the wood moved since I planed it a couple of days prior, or whether I just did a lousy job at planing the edge, I'm not sure. 
but for these situations I like to get the joint fitting nicely by hand using my record number 5 hand plane. I find it much easier to make small quick adjustments to an edge this way rather than setting up the planer again. And it's more important that the boards meet together without large gaps than it is the edge being perfectly straight. Here I'm doing a dry fit in clamps just to make sure they are all coming together nicely and it looked good. So I can start adding glue. Often I'll use dominoes just for alignment for glue ups like this, but it's not necessary. Instead I can just work from one end to the other with a few wax from the mallet to help get all of the boards flush. Then I can wipe away the excess glue and then get some clamps on top to even out the clamping pressure top and bottom. There were a few imperfections that need filling and I have some of this filler which should be a good colour match for beach. Then I can do the same again for the second desktop as I'm making an L shaped desk so this piece will be the side extension. And true to form this one needed a few tweaks to get good joins too. After about an hour I can get the first desktop flipped over so that I can get to the glue on the underside. And then I'm ready to glue up desktop number 2. Then I can get the ends cut clean and square. I wanted to cut a bevel under the edges and I'm going to be using a 2x2 to lift the guide rail of my track saw so that I can cut beyond the maximum 48 degree tilt. This took a bit of careful setup and I can use the clamps that came with the rails to hold everything steady. I can then tilt my saw to 48 degrees which is the furthest it tilts and with the blade set to cut at full depth I can cut the bevels. And I really like the end result. I want to avoid adding the bevel to one part of the desk though which is going to be where the two desktops join. So I'm marking up here to make sure that I don't cut the bevel in that area. With the top upside down I can cut away the remaining part and I'll work more on that area later on. So you'll see here I've glued up another piece of beach to form a corner between the two pieces that I've already worked on. And now I just need to figure out how I'm going to put all three pieces together. So most of this piece of beach that I've just milled up is going to get cut away and basically want to be left with a corner, something like that. However, I need to consider grain direction and allowing for expansion and contraction. And I've got three options. I can either glue this piece to this piece so that the grain is running in this direction and expansion and contraction will happen in this direction. Or I could glue it to this piece so that the grain is running in this direction and expansion and contraction happens in this direction. Or I can run the corner piece diagonally. To me that option seems like the worst one because it means that all three tops are going to be expanding and contracting in different directions. In the end I decided to join the corner piece to the main wider part of the desk. So I carefully marked up the piece I want to keep. and made more refinements with the hand plane to get the joint nice and tight before gluing it in place. Here I'm offering up my guide rail from the outside corner to the inside corner and then I can use my framing square referencing against the straight edge to mark up the angle which I think worked out to be about 50 degrees and the reason it's not 45 degrees is because one of the desktops is slightly deeper than the other. So I realised that 45 degrees would not look right. I can then measure that angle with my bevel gauge and replicate it at the back corner where I'm making another cutaway which will be used for mounting my monitors when it comes to installing the desk. I can then make the straight cuts, followed by the bevel cuts, and I can work on that area where the two bevels meet. I use my Japanese pull saw to cut away most of the excess and I'd do the rest with my chisel. But I had a bit of a problem here because when I was making the bevel cut to the corner piece the track must have slipped as there was quite a deep blade mark which completely threw off the bevel. So I did lots of chisel work to tidy up that area and in the end I was able to get it looking pretty good and even.
Here I'm offering up the two desktops together to check the join and they were not meeting together as good as I'd hoped so I made another cut with the track saw and then they met much better. Not perfect but I should be able to pull the join tight when it comes to installing the desk. I then get the tops flipped over so that they are upside down and I'm going to be installing some of these metal plates to the underside to join them together in a way that makes it easy for the desk to be dismantled if I ever need to move it around in future. After using an awl to mark the centre of each hole, I can then use an 8mm drill bit to drill a pilot hole. And I'm installing these threaded insert nuts. These are going to allow me to use some M6 bolts from underneath to secure the two tops together nice and strong. And here I'm just demonstrating how I'll add the bolts to the metal plates, locking the two tops together. But again I need to allow for movement of the wood because my solid wood tops are pretty wide and to do that I'm going to cut some slots in the metal plates. My first thought was to use the rotary tool to cut a slot and that worked okay but it took a long time to cut through this 3mm thick steel. I refined the shape with a file and here you can see that the bolt is going to be able to move back and forth as the wood expands and contracts. For the rest of the slots I just used a drill bit and angled the drill to create the slot. This didn't look particularly tidy but as it's underneath the desk and it'll be hidden behind a washer plus the head of a bolt, I didn't really care. Hello. I did remove those burrs with a file later though. Next I got all the sanding done starting with 80, then 120, then 180 grit. And I sanded the edges and the corners by hand. I wanted to keep them square in appearance but just soften the edges a bit. This video is sponsored by ITS for all the tools you need and their Black Friday sale is now on but time is running out you have until 6th of December and there are limited stocks so grab yourself a bargain while you can. You get next day delivery when you order by 7pm and ITS won't be beaten on price by Screwfix or Toolstation. I'll leave a link in the description box below if you'd like to check out what's on offer and you can expect great service too as ITS have over 21,000 5 star Trustpilot reviews. Where the two tops meet, I'm also going to use some dominoes just to help keep the two tops flush with one another. I'm drilling these ones on the tightest setting so that the dominoes fit nice and snug. And I can glue these in place now. But on the other piece that will join to this, I cut the first hole on the tight setting, then I moved up to the looser setting for the next, and even looser again for the third. And again this is to allow for movement so that the top can expand and contract as it needs to. And this side of the dominoes won't get glued, which again means that I'll be able to dismantle the desk in future if needed. So just to explain how I'm going to join the two pieces together allowing for expansion and contraction in more detail. These are my two desktop pieces. These arrows show the direction of the expansion and contraction, but I'm restricting movement from this corner. So here are my dominoes and the grey areas around them are the pockets that the dominoes are sitting in. This side the dominoes are glued in place and all the pockets are tight to the dominoes. And this side no glue will be used but this domino will be restricting the movement of the wood. This one is allowing movement and this one is allowing even more movement. And the same principle applies to the metal plates underneath. Two of them are fixing the two tops together restricting movement. The other three plates will allow the top to expand and contract as needed. For finish I'm going to use some water based varnish mainly because I want to retain the pale colour of the beach. I don't want to yellow it which an oil based finish would do. I'm going to try spraying this without diluting it at all. But I am going to run it through a filter just to make sure I don't get any bits into the cup of my spray gun. I set my spray pattern on a scrap of paper. And then I can start applying first to the bottom of the tops. Which got three coats denibbed in between with some 400 grit wet and dry paper. Applying it to the bottom as well as the top of the tops is important because it should help keep things even in terms of the amount of moisture the wood can absorb through humidity changes. When it came to doing the top sides I thought I'd try a trick that I've heard other people use which is to first wet the tops with some water to raise the grain before applying finish. I waited for it to dry and then denibbed. Then I blew away the dust and waited for it to settle before applying the first coat of finish. The theory is that wetting the grain and then denibbing means that the grain won't raise as much when the first coat of finish gets applied. However I found that the first coat of varnish still raised the grain just as much as it would have if I hadn't have applied the water and denibbed beforehand so I doubt I'll ever do this again. It seemed to me to be a complete waste of time. 
On the plus side though, spraying this water-based varnish without diluting it with more water actually worked perfectly well and I'll definitely do this again in future. So here I am applying the third and final coat of varnish. This is how it looks wet and it dries to a nice satin sheen and this stuff will give a really hard wearing finish too. So that's the desktops done and there's just one final thing I'd like to talk about and that's why I didn't opt to join the two desktop pieces together with a mitre joint and instead opted to do a 90 degree butt joint. As I'm expecting some people might ask that question. And the reason is again, expansion and contraction. Because the tops are so wide, using a mitre joint would have meant that when the tops expand, the outer corner would open up. And as they contract, the inner corner would open up. Stumpy Nubs has a good video about that and he explains it better than I will. So I'll leave a link to that down below in the description box if you'd like more information. And I'm going to leave it there for this one as this video is already quite long, but in the next video, I'll be making the base for the desk. Please subscribe to my channel for more weekly woodworking videos. If you'd like to help support the channel, plus get early access to my videos, free project plans and cut lists, and a name credit at the end of my videos, plus some exclusive videos like the ones on screen now, you'll find links to my Patreon and YouTube channel membership in the description box below. Thanks for watching.